welcome to Musings and Modalities. I'm your host, Tristan Stowicki. Think of me as your pragmatic shaman bestie. Join in with other high vibe, lovely people as I unravel spiritual ideas to help create change and growth in your life. I cover a variety of spiritual topics, sharing knowledge to meet you wherever you are in your journey. As a shaman, astrologer, and human design reader, I help you understand how to make informed decisions and incorporate different modalities using discernment in your own intuition. Today, you will gain powerful shamanic healing tools you can use to incorporate spiritual practices in non-traditional ways. Whether you're just beginning or need a knowledgeable best friend with the next phase of your journey, I'm here to help. Stay tuned. Musings and Modalities starts now. Hey everyone, and welcome to Musings and Modalities. I'm Tristan Stowicki, your pragmatic shaman bestie, and for the next 30 minutes, we'll be diving into my story from plant killer to herbalist, in which I'll talk about my journey in becoming a greenhouse goddess. I'll share my favorite plants and my recommendations for adding spirituality to gardening. So let me set the scene a little. The year is 2019. I was working in a day job that was incredibly stressful. It was somewhat fulfilling, but I really needed more in my life. And I thought about the things I always wanted to learn, you know, those pockets of time where you just kind of yearn for something more. Um, but I I never really took the time or I struggled with knowing which expert or resource to listen to when I thought about kind of a, a tug towards plants, you know, and kind of learning what it'd be like to, to call myself a gardener or even just to keep a single plant alive. I love to go on walks and most of the time I had no idea what to call the green beauties I would find. Is it poisonous? Can I eat it? You know, I was clueless about it all. I had at different times in my life kind of picked up plants from the grocery store or a farmer's market. And when they were at peak, peak beauty, they would inevitably not stay that way, right? They would just look really sad after a few weeks. And so I always felt like the problem was me. And it was definitely a me thing uh, when I take home this beautiful plant. And unfortunately, it starts to decline really quickly. So I started searching and I kept being drawn back to this very hardcore 1200 hour program that covers foraging, building a garden, herbs for digestion, the nervous system, and learning the science of soil. Um, this was a program that had like 17 different modules that would pretty much cover anything I'd want to know. And after completing the online course, passing some tests, practical assessments, and graded projects, um, this is like a degree in herbalism is really what it felt like. Um, I decided to, to go all in and to go for it. So I signed up for this program January 15th, 2020. And wow, what auspicious timing. Um, so I, I, inevitably had some free time to study and watch videos. Um, and even though it was a little bit hard to balance kind of the day job and life responsibilities, um, it was really joyful to kind of carve out any possible time on nights and weekends to learn about this whole new world. Um, initially, it kind of felt stifling to learn about plants while inside, especially. Um, so this time really transformed and became my connection to nature. Um, where I'd sit for several hours in my hammock in my backyard and watch videos about plants, learn about tinctures, and really I became educated in a whole way of living that was so unlike my life up until that point. It took close to two years to go through this 1200 hour program. I think they allow like two and a half years and for you to also still be able to be certified through it because it's it's a lot, right? And through that time, I had changed, not just because of the events in the world, but my own inner world was so much more full of magic and wonder. I found a deep connection to nature and a way to experience the seasons and cycles of life in a beautiful and fulfilling way. And this unfolded in a few ways for me. So by learning what plants need at a fundamental level and making sure they had what they needed to survive... I was able to really reflect and review my life and see where I wasn't giving myself enough time to just be, to enjoy the sunlight or spend some time in water. I found when I was taking care of plants, if I was drained or low energy, I'd start to see a decline in their vibrance. And when I was genuinely happy and relaxed, their beauty and energy was magnified. If you're someone that's just starting your journey with plants or you have a few plants, but maybe wouldn't necessarily consider yourself a gardener, I wanted to share a few recommendations for starting or adding to your current garden. So first and foremost, don't get overwhelmed by all of the choices of plants and their different needs. Um, 
So sometimes you'll see like this one needs low sun, this one needs full sun, this one can only be watered weekly, others it's when their soil is dry and it can feel like you need a calendar just to take care of your plants. It's a lot, right? And it can feel busy and really the opposite of connection. And what was great about in the training I did was that they were so wonderful about focusing only on core plants to start. Um, and so I really wanted to kind of share that wisdom here. There's a reason why herbs are sold everywhere, right? Rosemary, thyme, basil, and mint are all fantastic culinary herbs. They're fairly easy to keep alive and are super versatile and can be used in a ton of food and drink recipes. It's so rewarding to not to have to buy an ingredient and to feel so proud that you grew something. Um, so I definitely recommend you start in the herb family. And then from there, buy some seeds of your favorite flower. I love sunflowers, I love daisies, and any wildflowers. I do recommend that you find really good quality seeds, which I either buy locally or purchase from really reputable folks online. When you buy fully formed flowers in the store, even when they're in pots, they're typically at peak beauty already, and it can feel like a losing battle just to keep them beautiful. And that to me isn't enriching or fun at all. There's so much more wonder and joy from checking on these little seed trays, just waiting for peaks of green to pop up. Plus there's that feeling of accomplishment when you know the role you played in these gorgeous plants coming to life is super fulfilling. The reason I recommend starting with just a few plants, like six or less, um, is I want you to start building a relationship with each of these herbs and flowers. I want you to check on the growth each day. How do the leaves and flowers look? I kind of treat it like a check-in with a close friend. You know, you aren't looking to fix them. You aren't looking um, to be anything but kind of a listening ear, kind of checking in on them, and then seeing if there's any assistance you can offer, right? I really wouldn't bring worry into the conversation. This isn't a time to get concerned or stressed that the plant doesn't have everything it needs or if you're doing something wrong, right? This is a time for listening and gentle noticing only. I learned so much just by watching plants as they grow and learning about their different stages through experience. I let them grow and be as they want to, especially for the duration of the season when I plant them. I ask them, what do you need? And I sit quietly to hear them answer me. Now, this isn't something I Google or try to research. I really try to let the plants guide me. And sometimes that means I let them go past their harvest and I see what blossoms form from that. I also love to run experiments to see what the plants like, um, if they wanna be close together with another type of plant um, that's kind of paired in the same space. Do they enjoy the left or right side of the greenhouse? You know, different fun kind of things like that. In the process, I learned I also need plants in all phases of their growth. So during spring, summer, and fall, I want seed trays early in their germination period. I want seedlings that are ready to move into their own pots. I want fully formed flowers and fruits for harvesting. I need those different levels of gratification through these months as it keeps me motivated to spend time outside sweating and hauling dirt and fighting off bugs. This method also helps me stay curious and grateful. You know, for a long time before this period in my life, I didn't want any plants as they just felt like yet another thing to be responsible for. And I really didn't want that. I, I couldn't add to my life at that point. And so having constant change and excitement in the garden combats any of those feelings of responsibility for me. All right, so I've shared about my journey from plant killer to herbalist. I really wanna switch gears into becoming a greenhouse goddess and how I add spirituality to gardening. I love to work with the moon phases to determine um, some timing, right? To determine, you know, you know, when I should start things like that. So as a reminder, the moon phases are the new moon, then the moon is waxing and growing, the full moon, and then the moon starts to wane and gets small again and, and you know, and the cycle repeats. So I plant seeds during the new moon phase, which is a really cool way to track their growth. For the waxing moon, when the moon's starting to grow, I love to repot plants that have outgrown their current home. For the full moon, I harvest and sit in gratitude for the growth that's happened over the past few weeks. And then pruning and giving plants that have completed their journey back to earth and cleaning up my gardening tools in the area around the plants happens in the waning moon. It's also extra special when there is an earth sign in the new moon. 
Um, like we had the new moon in Taurus, that was May 7th, and that was such a gorgeous time for planting. This is a general guideline that I enjoy following, but this is also a wonderful place to listen to your intuition. Sometimes you have a few hours on a Saturday morning, and that happens not to be boiling outside, and there's a waning moon. You know, I'll still plant. I'll still repot and do all the practical things I need to do in the garden. Other times, the full moon might be better for my schedule, and I just like the energy of the week more, and I'll plant then too. So even though I gave some kind of guidance on how I generally do things, I don't want you to let general guidance ever stop you from spending time in nature or doing something you feel called to do. I love to bring spiritual elements into harvesting as well. I spend some time with each plant and ask them permission to harvest. I feel their leaves and blossoms and fruit, and I wait for them to tell me where to pick from. And I also honor if they prefer not to be picked today. You know, if they do allow me to pick from them, I thank them, and then I move on to the next plant. And I also wanted to include kind of four beautiful ways I love to work with the harvest of plants. So the first way, and it's one of the most special to me, is to create sand paintings. Sand paintings are a shamanic tool, which is the creation of a sacred circle of art. And for this circle, you essentially kind of find things in nature or things that are of significance to you to transform yourself and old stagnant energies. I love to go into my greenhouse and use the sunflowers and squash blossoms and calendula to bring such beauty and color to the sand painting. It's basically a feast for the eyes. The second way is as offering. So I actually grow my own tobacco that I can dry and leave at the base of trees when I visit a land that's new to me. I'm careful to only do this with plants that are indigenous to where I'm visiting. And this is my way of respectfully greeting the land spirits and guardians of new places and spaces where I'm returning to. I may also offer a short song, melody, or reiki as well. And really, this is similar to when we bring food or drinks when we're visiting someone's home, right? It's the exact same sentiment. Um, if you're visiting a place where you're not sure what flowers are indigenous, you know, a beautiful song, melody, humming something, or just a simple thank you is always really welcome. The third way I love to uh, use harvest plants is as nourishment or helping with ailments, right? There's a reason why we garden, and part of that is to actually eat um, from that. There's something so magical about eating tomatoes or zucchini directly from your backyard. I also think that everyone should have an aloe plant and several calendula plants. It's one of my all-time favorite plants, and it's so useful. Um, I love using it for mosquito bites, and it's soothing for a variety of ailments. It's easy to grow and has beautiful orange flowers, and the energy of the plant's so happy and light. Um, so I always recommend having it in the garden. And the final way I wanted to recommend is in spell work or candle work. When lighting candles inside my home or outside in the yard, I love to create a circle of natural elements. This includes rocks, crystals, flowers, leaves, and anything else that may call to me. Depending on the candle work or spell, I may bring in rosemary or lavender for protection. You know, anywhere where I've studied the properties of the plant, and I'll see what lends itself to this sacred work. I also want to call out, I never throw away plant matter. Um, so after you're done with your candle work or spell, um, I either compost it, sprinkle it on the earth, or bury it. And how I dispose of the uh, materials really depends on the type of spell and the energies that have come into the circle. Um, so there are four ways I love to work with the harvest of plants and by creating sand paintings as offerings, as nourishment, or for spell work. I wanted to add in, there was a number of intuition elements here, which, you know, I don't want you to feel daunting at all. So I wanted to talk about how you can use your pendulum to check whatever your plant needs. You know, you can actually use it to ask individually if a plant needs more sunlight, more water. Does it need more or less of something? Does it like its neighbor? You can also check to see if it's ready for harvest, to be repotted, or if it just wants to grow and let it be on its own. I'll also check if a plant wants to join in candle work. You know, even if it doesn't have a property I would normally associate with that work, um, I'm always happy to have them join the party if there's something, you know, they can lend and help with. As you're building up your intuition in this new and exciting way, the pendulum is such a great tool to help guide you in this space. 
I also encourage you to speak to your plants, you know, um, try to do this without judgment. I know you might feel a little silly at first, but I really try to greet them as friends. I go out to see them each day. I talk about any new growth, you know, I'll gently touch the new seedlings coming up and encourage them on the race to feel the sun. I openly share excitement and good vibes. I'll also ask them what they need. And I love experimenting with their placement in the garden. All of my plants are in containers, so I can easily move them into more sun or shade. And I also love to track which plants and the side of the garden that the bees, birds, and butterflies are more drawn to. Now, I want to share the story of sunflowers and yellow finches. Um, this is kind of a funny story that really allowed me to not take gardening so seriously. Sunflowers are my all-time favorite flower. I love their sunny disposition. I love their height, their gorgeous, huge faces. You know, I love that they come in different colors from yellow to orange and autumn. It's so cool. The first year I ever grew sunflowers, I planted way too many. <laughs> um, part of me disagrees that you can ever have too many plants of any kind, but I did have close to 40 different sunflowers and four different types and colors. So as I tend to, I overdid it a little bit. This year, I'm definitely scaling back. And I kept finding that the taller, you know, the sunflowers grew, the more they struggled to stand upright, which is so frustrating, you know, because that's kind of not the whole point of sunflowers, but it's very cool. They're a very tall plant. And then weirdly, some started growing in a circular pattern and others at awkward angles, or they were just leaning over. I would look out in my backyard and it was like a pose contemporary dance, just all harsh angles and a little off-putting, which is not the energy I want when I look in my backyard, right? And so I was problem solving. I bought string, different, different metal supports. I rotated them and wow, did it feel like a full-time job trying to get these sunflowers to have any semblance of standing up tall. And the other part that was kind of weird was that some of them would break off or had really extreme bends that were just bizarre, right? Near the end of the season, I'm looking out my upstairs window and like this went on and on, like several weeks to months, you know, it was a whole thing. It was almost like drama in the garden. And I'm looking out my upstairs window and I see two beautiful yellow finches, right? How cool. And I see as one of them lands on the head of a sunflower, dipping the stem down as it eats um, from kind of the, the sunflower head. And it's the stem is almost touching the earth when it does that. And I just had to laugh because you just see the sunflower kind of keel over completely as the finch touched down and the finch is just eating. And then the finch flew away and it just kind of popped back up. But of course there was still that bend in them. So I really did have to take that in for a few moments and just giggle because I had all of that fussing and problem solving just for a bird trying to eat, right? Which I love. This part of the reason why I have a garden is not just for myself, but to give back to the earth. And so, um, so anytime I start to get frustrated or annoyed when nature isn't bending to my will, I just have to think on this story and laugh a, a little bit and just let it go. So this was a story where I was unknowingly helping my animal friends, and I wanted to share a few ways where I give back to my community and Pache Mama, Mother Earth, knowingly, right? So for each seed packet or set of seeds I use, I give a portion of that to the earth in my yard. I sprinkle it around for the birds and, you know, for the earth in general. I share this freely with no expectation of growth. This is intentionally not for me or for my garden. This act is an honor. Um, it's, it's really to honor all that the earth freely gives and shares with us. I also intentionally plant for my community and extended family. So I openly share my plants with those who want or need it. Um, this happens very frequently as with the sunflower story, I tend to plant quite a bit. Um, and so it's kind of a habit that I've had from my very first garden where I share that, um, especially, I don't even consider it extra. Like I have a feeling as I'm going to put things in the seed trays about who they might go to. And so I feel that call about who might, you know, need this plant or set of plants in their life. Um, I also share seeds and any garden extras I have um, to pass along my love of the earth and the soul enriching experience of gardening. 
I also made the decision and choice not to do it all. I'm very thoughtful in picking and choosing what to create, what to I'm planting myself. Um, like, sure, I could create tinctures and salves, right? I could make syrups and teas and plant everything from scratch. In 1,700 hours of herbalism, you do truly learn it all. And I had to not only learn it all, but actually do it all in order to get my certification. At, and I do enjoy it very much, but I found that, you know, when I attempted to do it all or try to, it doesn't really leave space for me to support other herbalists or other small businesses and local shops. I don't want cabinets full of excess stuff. You know, I really want to spend time where I get the most fulfillment currently. And each year that shifts a little bit. Um, but I always want to make sure there's space left to support others. I never want to lose my skills in these areas. So each season I decide what I'll make for one or two tinctures or um, two to three very small batch syrups. Um, but I really love kind of meeting new people and supporting my community in this way as well. I wanted to share my BFFs only tip. So many times, especially when I'm having conversations about crystals, so many people ask, you know, when they have a crystal that breaks or they don't feel as connected to it anymore, um, what to do with it. And so I really love to use crystals in my garden. I have them in my greenhouse. I have them with my plants. And anytime a crystal breaks, I actually save it um, to the side um, until I'm ready to put it in my garden. And I'll actually put those crystal pieces in with my plants, in with the soil, in the, with the different containers, which is such a beautiful way to honor them, um, to thank them, and also give them back to the earth. Um, I also really love to use quartz and put some very small quartz points um, you know, on the top of the soil of a plant um, if it needs some extra attention or some extra care or if it's fighting off, you know, any kind of um, like insects or anything like that. Crystals also can be help be a deterrent, especially if I put kind of Reiki energy into them. Um, so I just wanted to share kind of a beautiful way that you can reuse um, those broken crystals or any crystals that you don't feel called to work with anymore and kind of celebrate them in a, a different way. As we close today, I wanted to share a poem I wrote um, while in my herbalist training to remind you we all start from the same place. We all start with beginner's mind, and we all start with a bit of hope, curiosity, and of course, vulnerability. This is vulnerability. A seedling bursts forth in damp smelling earth, an upward offering of underground strength, rooted in hope. Unburdened by memories of past aches, of unresolved discussions, of dread and disease. Water remembers, yet the seedling only knows how to move to the light, to be amenable, to unfold, to persist. Thank you so much for watching Musings and Modalities with me, your pragmatic shaman bestie. I hope this episode was really helpful in kind of demystifying herbalism and making it, you know, a little bit easier and more accessible for you to think about working with plants, inviting you to start, you know, growing from seeds and really learning um, how you can, you know, just bring more earth and joy and life into your life. Um, you can tune in the second and fourth Mondays of each month at 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern for more fabulous episodes. As a reminder, I do offer free 30-minute consultations if you have additional questions on how I might be able to help and if it's a full body yes to work with me. I do have a new offering for those that want to work with me but aren't sure where to start. Uh, this is called Unsure What to Book, um, and that's where you get 90 full minutes with me. Uh, we can discuss pretty much anything there. Um, you know, if you want to learn more about astrology or herbalism or Reiki, I'm happy to answer any questions. And I've also recently um, added an offering for home clearing and land clearing. So as you kind of work outside more uh, this summer or as you spend more time at home, um, if you're finding your space isn't as, you know, inviting as it used to be, as fresh as it used to be. That is a two se session offering. I do it remotely. Um, so if you're anywhere in the world, I'm happy to work with you. Um, and through that, you know, I'm able to really get the space 
the energy of the home and the land back into alignment and get rid of any kind of um, harsh energies, entities, or anything of the like. Um, you can book that session and others at musingsandmodalities.com. Thank you so much for listening. You've been listening to Musings and Modalities with me, Tristan, your pragmatic shaman bestie. For more powerful healing tools, join me every second and fourth Monday at 8 a.m. Pacific on Transformation Talk Radio. I cover a variety of topics to meet you wherever you are at on your spiritual journey. Learn techniques to work with pendulums, past life healing, astrology, and more. Please share the show and subscribe for more guidance from your pragmatic shaman bestie at musingsandmodalities.com.